Okay, so now what we're going to look at is an aspect of chess that really attracts many, many players to the game, and that is sacrificing. So what is a sacrifice? That's the first question. Well, it's simply any move that gives up some kind of material. Typically, it's a piece, but even a pawn. And in return for this material, you gain something, or your opponent gains something. And what is that something? Well, usually it's some kind of tangible tactical benefit. So for instance, an attack on the king, or maybe a, a fork down the road, something like that. But other times it's also just uh, positional compensation. So either tactical compensation or strategic compensation. There simply has to be some kind of payoff in return for the material that you gift your opponent. Besides that, we should know that there are a couple of categories of sacrifice. We could split sacrifices into real sacrifices and into what we call pseudo sacrifices. So a real sacrifice is one where the player who sacrifices material doesn't actually see a way of getting that material back. But perhaps he sees long-term positional benefits or something along those lines or maybe a very, very strong attack but that player is prepared to continue down material whereas a pseudo sacrifice is one that if accepted then the player who sacrificed material will either get back the material often with interest or perhaps even do something like checkmate the opponent you know in theory it's a sacrifice but in practice, if the opponent accepts it, he will be in trouble. So that's more or less what you need to know as an introduction. I will just add one more distinction between sacrifices, and that is forced sacrifices versus non-forced. So a forced sacrifice is one where the opponent must accept it. And if he doesn't accept it, he will be in a lot of trouble. Whereas a non-forced sacrifice is one where, you know, let's say I offer you a piece, but if you don't take it, your position will continue to be perfectly playable. So as a competitive chess player, it's important to know these two categories so that you can decide if it's a non-force sacrifice, whether or not you want to accept the gift. So the first position that we have here is actually a game with Vichy Anand playing the black pieces, and his opponent, Mr. Alexei Shirov, played knight to b3, and then played the move rook to c8. And now, white played queen to h3, and here Anand captured the knight on c3. He sacrificed the rook, sacrificed the rook for a knight. That's an exchange sacrifice. And this is an example of a real sacrifice, because after pawn takes rook, there is no clear way in which black can recover the material. So he's willing to play an exchange down for the foreseeable future. It is also an example of a forced sacrifice. After the move rook takes c3, if white doesn't accept the gift, he will have to play a piece down. So there was no choice. And so then the question is, well, we said at the start that one sacrifices in order to get some type of compensation in return. So what type of compensation did black get? Well, here in my view, it's a mixture of a strategic and tactical compensation, both positional and tactical advantages. Positionally, we see that the pawn structure has been worsened. And in addition to this, we see that the white king is on c1. This diagonal has been opened. So black has worsened his opponent's pawn structure and has weakened his opponent's king. Tactically, well, Anand continued with the move queen to c7. And there's the possibility, having sacrificed, there's an immediate threat on an undefended target. So there are some very concrete benefits as well. As it happens, the sacrifice was sound. In other words, it was correct and Anand went on to win the game. Let's take a look at some more sacrifices. 
This next game is one that I chose because it shows both a real sacrifice and a pseudo sacrifice. So let's see what happened. In this position, white went for a sacrifice with the move rook takes d5. Black here, this is absolutely a forced sacrifice, he must accept. So he captured the rook. And White's idea is basically to follow up with knight takes pawn on b7. The bishop was protecting that point. And now as a result, White has got this strong passed pawn. He has also now got the bishop pair, which is a secondary consideration. Black continued with the move rook to b8, since the knight was attacking the rook. White pushed his pawn forward. And now Black made a mistake. The position is roughly equal, but he made the move knight to e7, which is really logical. He simply is attacking the pawn on c6. But white had a strong response, a pseudo-sacrifice. White plays the move knight to d4. The point is that, sure enough, black can capture this knight, but the bishop on h2 is pointing at the rook on b8. So in the absence of the pawn on e5, white will be able to capture the rook. Now, you might be asking yourself, and by the way, if this example seems quite complicated, don't worry at all. It's just to illustrate the important points. It's not about, you know, figuring out all the lines or anything like that. So we'll see what happens after pawn takes d4, you might be asking yourself, well, how is this a pseudo-sacrifice? Remember, we said a pseudo-sacrifice is one where if the material is accepted, the side that sacrificed material will get that material back, at the very, very least, end up in the same situation as he was before, or in general, he will actually be better off. So he maybe will sacrifice a knight and... If it's accepted, he'll end up with a rook, something like that. So why is this a pseudo-sacrifice? Well, so far, white sacrificed his knight on d4. And now after bishop takes rook, rook takes bishop, a good question is, well, white gave up a knight and now his bishop, and in exchange, he got a rook on b8. Two minor pieces are worth more than a rook. So where is the pseudo-sacrifice? Well, the point is that now white has the move c7, threatening to capture the rook on b8. The rook must move. The best square to go to is rook to c8. But now here is the very clever point. White plays knight to d6. A brilliant idea. Attacking the rook on c8. Now, after rook takes pawn on c7, white goes rook b8 check. Now, the point is that the black king is blocked in, hemmed in by his own pieces. He cannot go to f7 because the knight on d6 covers this square. So therefore, black must block the check with a move like knight to c8. And now after knight takes knight, we see that if we look at the material count now, well, white has a knight and bishop, as does black the same number of pawns, but white's pieces are much, much better placed. And as a result, black is actually completely lost here. One of the problems for black is that white is threatening some deadly discovered checks. So a move like knight to b6 is what was seen in the game. Black played f5, knight b6 check, and after king to f7, white simply collected that knight on a4 and was up a piece. But in fact, black couldn't really improve matters because let's say he played a move such as king to f7 to step away from discovered checks. Well, here after the move knight d6 check, we see that black has three different options to go to e6, g6, or e7. But in fact, they all have serious problems. Let's say king goes to g6. Here now, white will give a check on d3. 
And black has two choices. Either he goes to h6, but if he does so, then white will play move like knight f5 check, and king has to step back to g6, and well, you know, we were trying to avoid getting ourselves into the line of a discovered check, and this is what ends up happening. So of course, not a success for black. And alternatively, black can play the move f5, but at the very, very least, he will be down a pawn following bishop takes f5. And on top of that, just to make matters worse, the king cannot go to f6 because the king would be on f6, the rook on c7, and the nasty 98 check would win a full rook. So therefore, the king would have to step to h6. But here, the king is in pretty bad shape. In fact, just uh, as an illustrative line, if white were to play the move rook to c8, black would not even be able to capture the rook, since white would not recapture, but instead play knight f7 with a very nice checkmate. So we see that after king f7, knight d6 check, yeah, king g6 is not a very good option. And after king e6, then white will go knight to f5. And we can see that the white pieces are all much more dominant than black's pieces. We see a strong knight on f5, a bishop that is a light square bishop that has many options, and a rook that is active along the last rank. So again, this position is hopeless for black. Okay, so we seen a couple of somewhat advanced examples. Let's take a look at a simpler example of a sacrifice, but that is one of the most famous examples in chess, and that is Legal's trap or Legal's mate. So let's take a look at that now. So this game now that we're about to show was played by Mr. De Legal against a man by the name of Saint Brie, I hope I'm doing the pronunciation justice. This game was played in Paris in 1750, so quite a long time ago at this point. And what happened was white played e4, black played e5, knight f3, d6, a Philidor's defense, bishop to c4, and now black played the move bishop to g4. White continued with knight to c3, and here black makes a mistake. He plays the move g6. Now, the bishop on g4 is undefended, and white combines this fact with a very, very nasty mating pattern and plays the sacrifice knight takes e5. Now, again, here black must decide between two options. He can capture the knight or he can capture the queen. Now, if he captures the knight, then after queen takes bishop, white is up a pawn. And so we can say that this is a pseudo-sacrifice. It's a very temporary sacrifice and white actually ends up material head. However, in the game, black took white's queen. And this was a big mistake because after the move, bishop takes f7 check. Now, the knight not only defends the bishop, but also protects against king d7. So the king must go to e7. And now, legal's mate occurs after knight d5 checkmate. Because we notice in this position here, the king only has these two squares available to it. Knight d5 covers both. This is a, a very, very famous trap, which you may have already come across. But, you know, really one that is quite useful to know because, especially in blitz games, it's quite likely that one of your opponents will fall for it sooner or later. Let's actually take a look at a more advanced example that uses this same theme. So here, white played e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop to c4, d6, knight to c3, 
bishop to g4, again we can see similarities, pawn to h3, and here in fact we can say that this move bishop to g4 was already a mistake because here black has kind of an unpleasant choice between either retrieving his bishop, which wouldn't make too much sense, capturing this knight on f3, which would give white the bishop pair, or retreating the bishop to h5, which is what many, many players do, unaware of Legal's trap. White captures on e5, and now if bishop takes queen, we see the same thing again. Bishop takes f7 check, king to e7, knight d5 is checkmate. So the question is, why is this a more advanced version? Well, because white has to see one important variation after knight takes e5. In the previous example, black cannot play the move knight takes e5. That wasn't an option for him. Here, however, black can play knight takes e5, and after queen takes bishop, it seems as though black will actually be winning material, following on from knight takes c4. And so what white must realize is that after queen takes bishop, knight takes bishop, white has a clever tactical resource, queen b5 check, attacking the undefended knight on c4 and recovering material up a pawn. So again, we can say that it is indeed a pseudo-sacrifice. And yeah, this is a very useful pseudo-sacrifice to know. I want to show you an example of this very same theme being applied in a middle game position taken from a Spanish opening, actually, the Rui Lopez. So let's check that out now. In this position, white played the best move that borrows from the legal trap, and he played the move knight takes e5. This is a clever move because black can react in a couple of different ways. The first is he can simply grab the knight, but after this white will capture the bishop on g4 and will have won a pawn. The only other options are to capture the queen. So let's see what happens there. Well, after bishop takes d1, white plays knight d7 check. And now the point is that the black king must move to either e8 or g8. g8 is best. And now knight takes queen, comes in with check again. Pawn takes knight. And now simply capturing the bishop on d1. And we see that white has a much, much better position. Material is one pawn to the good for white, but he also has better placed pieces and a better pawn structure. So he is doing very, very well here. There is the question of what if bishop takes e3? After bishop takes e3, white could recapture, hoping that after a move like pawn takes knight, then queen takes bishop, and once again, white is practically winning. But the problem with this is that if black played the move queen h4 check, then white would have nothing better than g3, and after bishop takes queen, then this position is actually very good for black because after pawn takes queen, bishop takes bishop, rook takes bishop, and pawn takes knight, we see that here in this position, black is actually a piece up. So what should white do? Well, here, after the move bishop takes e3, White has the move knight takes bishop on g4. And this is very nice because it attacks the queen and the bishop on e3 while also defending from f2 and retreating the knight from a point, from a square where it was being about to be captured. So this is a very nice move. And after this, 
black must move his queen. White will capture the bishop on e3. Okay, I mean, of course, black could capture here on f2, but after knight takes bishop, white is also up a piece. So the game is over. Okay, so let's take a look at one more example of sacrifice in this introductory video, and uh, then we'll take up the topic of sacrifices in the next few videos. Okay, so here we have a very, very famous position. Let's actually take a step back to this position here. And black is uh, clearly just winning. He is up a piece here. And on top of that, the white king is very, very unsafe. Uh, white played the move pawn to h4. And now black gave a check on e2. And white stepped the king back to h1. So, why is this position famous? Well, First of all, because it was played by two very, very well-known players, Larry Evans and Sammy Ryszewski, or Samuel Ryszewski, to give him his full name. And in chess, we have a, a term which you may be familiar with called a swindle. A swindle is when you are in a winning position and your opponent somehow tricks you and saves either a draw or, or maybe even turns the tables completely and, and beats you. That's known as a swindle, right? Because you thought you had it in the bag and then your opponent somehow pulls off a save. And this game is really a, a quite epic swindle by Larry Evans with the white pieces. You see, Mr. Evans coaxes black to capture on g3 and now notice that the white king has nowhere that it can move to. And the pawns also cannot move. And therefore, white took advantage of this with the clever move, queen g8 check. Now, black has to accept the queen, otherwise he will actually lose if he steps on to h6. White will go queen h8 check, king to g6, and now queen takes g7 will be checkmate. So, black took the queen, and now white gave up his final piece. Rook takes g7 with check. The problem is that if black accepts the rook, then it is stalemate. White has no legal move. And if instead black, say, steps to f8, then white will insist on sacrificing his rook, rook f7 check, king to e8, and no matter how many squares the king moves towards the queen side, it'll be the same trick. There is no way to avoid either perpetual checks or, if the sacrifice is accepted, stalemate. So this was really a very, very nice and famous swindle by Larry Evans. But the point is that sacrifices are also important tools for saving lost positions. So sometimes you can make a sacrifice just to avoid losing. Here is one of the most famous examples of this. So this has completed the introduction to sacrifices section. And now over the, the coming sections, we will talk about certain types of sacrifice in more detail. So I'll see you there.